Hello, we will give people a few moments to, um, to join in. While we are waiting, um, let's go ahead and um, please make sure you add yourself to the to the attendees list. So right now we only have five people listed. We have more than five people here. Welcome all. Hello. Hey. Hey. A few, few quick housekeeping notes before I presume Frederick is about to get us started. This meeting is recorded automatically. It is published to YouTube automatically. So keep that in mind. Yeah, we have Ed on auto whenever he joins. He just automatically says that. Yeah, I'm thinking of just recording it and clicking play. Yeah, also we have no control over the recording itself, so we can't stop it and start what? up for you again. So. Yeah, one sec. Anyways, we need somebody to to put in the um, the, the meeting notes. So if someone can add the meeting notes to the chat, that'd be very helpful. Cool. Okay, let's get anything I would like to discuss that is not on the agenda yet.
So I actually have something. Oh, real quick, um, I did put the link to the, the meeting minutes in the chat. If folks could go ahead and add themselves to the attendees list, that would be great. So, okay, let's let's go ahead and um, actually there's a little bit of noise on the line as well. Cool. Okay, so let's go and get started. So events coming up. Uh, we have KubeCon EU. The call for papers for KubeCon EU is now closed. The we have multiple topics that were that were submitted um do we do we know when um oh yes do we do we know when the decisions are going to be made uh let me see if i can find out quickly it shouldn't be hard yeah it'd be nice to add that to the agenda i'll go ahead and add it for next time cool we have also a co-located event at the at the KubeCon EU, the FIDO Mini Summit. The call for papers date is to be, I believe is, is uh, well, I don't have any information on that yet. So we'll have to look up to see when the call for papers is for that. In, um, fair, in fairness, no one has information on that yet, but we do anticipate <coughs> looking to that. So, and, and talks about the network service match went super well there last time. So I expect they will as well. Yeah, that was really enjoyable. I, I would gladly talk there again. We have uh, Mobile World Congress coming up. And so definitely looking forward to seeing what uh, what pops out there. We have ONS North America. The call for papers are now closed as of yesterday. The talks will be, that conference will be held in San Jose in uh, in early April. And it's very, uh, very telco, very NFV centric. Um, I think it always is. We have, we also have some uh, other interesting events coming up, which may or may not have uh, uh, NSM in, involved, but is interesting to to look at anyway. Which includes FOSDEM. In uh, in Brussels, we have. Uh, an MPLS SD and NFV that's occurring in, in Paris. There is Container World 2019 in Santa Clara that's going to happen in mid April. And Service Mesh Day, um, where I, I need to submit a talk to Service Mesh Day. It's, it's here in the California, excuse me, here in the California area. Uh, the, the call for paper on that one, if anyone else wants to submit anything, is on February 8th. And so it closes on February 8th. Cool. So we have a uh, couple announcements. So Nikolai, your SDK endpoint main, main go preview. Uh, you want to say a few words about it? Um, yeah, I can share the current code. Yeah, let me, let me stop sharing here. You can share. <coughs> I guess this one. Um, you see my VS Code. We can see it clearly. Yeah. Okay. Good. So. Um, yeah. So as of last week, I believe. Yeah, uh, we have merged the uh, um, this new concept of how we can write NSCs and uh, NSCs, so endpoints and clients. And uh, one of the major interesting things, uh, besides the fact that we have wrapped all the, you know, details of uh, how you set up uh, um, the communication with uh, the NS uh, manager, with, with the NSM manager, 
uh, and all the, 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 the details there. Um, so the other thing uh, that actually was uh, came up uh, during the, 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 the reviews so with that, uh, the discussions, is this uh, you know, idea of being able to compose small pieces of software, yeah, um, <clears throat> small pieces of functionality uh, and to produce a larger, um, um, you know, more complex uh, functions. Uh, this is specific for the endpoints, for the NSCs. And this is the main, how the main of the <coughs> uh, firewall that we use in our uh, VPN demo, uh, how it looks today. Um, so, it's a very, very simple as you can see, uh, but the most important part about the um, composition and being uh, able to compose the uh, <coughs> the small functional blocks uh, is this one here. Um, essentially, uh, you instantiate uh, uh, here is the monitor and then you say set next and then the next is the ACL, then you have the cross connect, then you have the uh, client uh, and then you have the connection. Uh, so what the client and connection are actually doing because I guess that the monitor ACL and cross connect are somehow self-explanatory. So the client uh, uh, is uh, essentially a way for the NEC to connect to the next uh, endpoint, to the next NEC. So um, using the configuration or the environment variables, you, you can configure it uh, and actually uh, this uh, in this specific case, it lets the firewall connect to the VPN gateway. So this way we have, um, we achieve um, endpoint uh, composition or chaining. Um, so this is, uh, let's say, one of the interesting com com concepts that we have introduced uh, with the um, SDK. Uh, other than that, uh, you just, uh, create a new endpoint, pass a configuration, here is a context or it can be new. Uh, and the co composites, which are actually uh, the functions that needs to be called once uh, the endpoint receives a request or the chain of the functions, composite of the functions. Uh, you check for errors and then you do start and uh, defer the delete of the endpoint, then you wait for the signals and etc. So that's how you do uh, today or you can do today uh, the endpoints. Of course, if someone wishes, uh, it can of course import the right pieces from, uh, from NSM and can do it all by itself. But uh, I think that this is a nice, uh, nice way to actually achieve uh, quickly uh, some results. So um, with the SDK, uh, we have some of the. <clears throat> so uh, this sorry. Is, this is super cool because what it means is, you know, when you when you want to make a net network service endpoint that does something, you can take lots of small pieces of functionality off the shelf and just chain them together, um, and and then you only have to write the tiny piece of functionality that is different in your case, right? So. You know, if you wanted to say, for example, construct something that was going to be doing a natting behavior um, on the way through, you would just have to write a little piece of functionality that configured the right nat behaviors. Um, <clears throat> and you could reuse all these other components. Um, mm -hmm. Just compose a different component in. Yeah, that's uh, actually what I was also going to say. So he here you can see how we are, uh, composing together a predefined components because all these one that, that come from the composite package, they are something that are distributed uh, with the SDK. So we have the monitor uh, and the client and the connection, they're already there. And you can chain them with uh, the ACL, for example, that is uh, something that is written only within this specific endpoint uh, example with the, within the firewall. Um, so yeah, so the SDK comes with uh, some of the of the packages. One of uh, with the composites. One of them are the uh, where was the SDK? 
Okay, it's the scripts. Oh, okay. Um, uh, so one of them is, for example, the IPAM, which actually uh, incorporates all the uh, IP pool, uh, IP prefix pools that that were um, lately introduced. Um, and so you can you can have um, IPAM management and uh, all the all the all the nice things there. Uh, lastly, for this, uh, I would like to just show you how the client looks. <clears throat> So, except from the nice Jaeger, that actually is another nice thing that we introduced. Uh, uh, can, can I just jump in a moment? Um, yes. So, the, the things you're composing there, are they APIs or functionality? Um, so, the, there is an interface, uh, which actually has a number of methods that you need to implement. So, request, close, uh, and uh, a couple of others. And uh, once you just implement that interface, you can you can do this, this composition. And uh, and again, are those APIs or functionality? Uh, I mean, is this just a list of the APIs or is this both the APIs and the functionality you're pulling in to compose? So Ian, 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 I think this is probably gonna make it clear. The, the, the API is simply the network service API, local network service API that's defined in Proto. So it's exactly the same API that gets spoken to the server um, as you go along. Um, these blocks are functional blocks that do things. So the new connection composite when it receives the, it receives a request, it requests the HTTP. You know, the new client comes up, it receives a request. It then goes and asks for a new connection and plugs it into VPP. The cross connect composite when it receives okay, a but, but, but okay. So so let me take uh, um, a different approach at that. Right, we have a an ACL composite there. Right, so that's the implement of, implementation of ACLs on VPP with both an API and the code that programs VPP. But yeah. the reason I'm asking is because it seems to me that we should have an abstract ACL API and a um, a concrete implementation of that API for whatever forwarder we're using. And I'm asking, are they separated? So, no. so, so here's the thing, Ian. Um, the API is the, the network service request API. The basic pattern here is... You know, that well, uh, uh, the ACLs are not the basic request API. I might have ACLs or I might not have ACLs. So this is a simple implementation that simply does the, does the work for ACLs for VPP. If I wanted to do something mm -hmm. like for ACLs for something else, I would wire in a different component that did the work for ACLs. Uh, yeah, I get that. But again, it, you're saying this is an NSM API, but I fail to understand how ACLs come in as an NSM API, because there's more than one API that would implement ACLs. Potentially, we might change it, or somebody might choose to do it differently, whether or not we've got a standard. So again, I, I'm a little confused here why NSM is getting involved with ACLs. No, I think your confusion is that you think we have an ACL API here. We don't. And well, I, you said that that's an API and an implementation. So, so where is it getting its information? You're associating, the, you're associating the wrong semantics to the API. The semantics right, so tell me what the right semantics are. The semantics to the API are simply request close. That's the API semantics. The API Fine, API, so what's this? This is an implementation that, when it receives request and close, will apply ACLs according to whatever it gets in whatever manner it gets, which may be from a configuration that's passed into the component at creation time. It may be trolling through environment variables. None of that is actually our concern. Um, it's the concern of the guy who's writing this little... So it's, it's effectively a list of hooks on the request close process. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Right, fine. That, that makes sense. Yeah. So it, it's, it's, it's super, super simple and super, super flexible. And it gives us lots of small, little reusable components. Okay. So uh, quickly, let's see the just, just the client. So you just establish the client. I mean, instantiate it. Then you say connect with uh, interface name. What type do you want? Kernel on mem uh, interface, some description, and that's it. That's the very, very basic client. Of course, you can do a little bit different things uh, here. Maybe we will show next time the proxy, but that's what the client does today. Uh, and that's it. If there are any, there aren't any questions, I will stop sharing and we can move on to the next thing. Is this already been merged in or is this uh, still in progress? No, no, it's, it's merged. This is, yeah. There this you is go. In, the, in the master, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks. But any other questions or do we move on to the open tracing demo? Cool. So 
Okay. Gut. We've done training. We'll pass it on. So we've got Andre up next to show us the open tracing work. Uh, yes. Let, let me please share my screen. So basically what we have is uh, open tracing server, which is uh, deployed as a part of our infrastructure uh, in the pod. And also all GRPC calls are instrumented within, within the code, uh, very simple way. Do you see my screen? Okay. Yeah. Uh, like we need to add a couple of interceptors to uh, gRPC servers and uh, interceptors to gRPC clients. Uh, so after uh, infrastructure deployed, we need to forward ports uh, open tracing server ports and play with open tracing. So there's a request to increase the font size on the terminal if possible. Uh, yes, I'll try. Uh, Usually command plus or dot uh -huh. plus will scale up, but it varies by operating system. There we go. <clears throat> okay, so we have forward imports. Uh, so uh, let's see some nice cases. They display it in this form. Also, you can see payload on the call, like uh, request parameters and responses. So errors. So something, something probably not deployed by machine. That's it. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, this this should make debugging quite a bit easier. I know before we were scraping through logs, trying to correlate things to figure out what was going on. Um, and so from here, we can actually track these things. We can also get a sense of how long things are taking, which is super helpful. Um, so to say, okay, well, where, where are we picking up latency in the system? So this is overall really exciting. So uh, can I ask a quick question? So uh, I know that this for open tracing, we can notice the time for inner each services, uh, but what about other major, like, like say how many attempts we try to start a service or um, failures, those kind of information. Uh, do we have tools to do that? Uh, yes, with manual coding, yes, but not automatically. Mm -hmm. Also, a parallel question. Um, so obviously, being able to look at this stuff live is good, but is there plans to kind of come up with some like long-term debugging tools too, and like some like log scraping tools, things like that? Cool. So I I think that you can actually dump the results of these traces. Um, into longer term storage as well. The, the thing is, <coughs> think of logging and tracing this way, right? So logging is a linear collection of events in time 
coming off of a particular container, right? So lots of events are, com are happening, but not all of them are directly related, but you have a time order of them. Tracing gives you a time ordered set of events related to particular sets of calls. So it's actually quite a bit better for figuring out, okay, we have errors, what happened in those errors? You're, you're kind of hopeless simply scraping logs in that case, or at least it's a hugely greater amount of work. Um, so that, that, that ends up being super useful. And I think then the other question was sort of about metrics, right? Capturing general metrics on the system, like how many failures have we seen, et cetera. And for mm -hmm. that, I think we probably want to integrate with something like Prometheus. Um, uh, sorry. That was going to be my next question. Yeah, some yeah. kind of like time uh, yeah. series database to consume all this information, right? Like if you want to get operations groups across the industry to buy into this, then they need visibility tools and they need to be able to like do forensics when things go terrible. Well, this is actually one of the reasons why Jaeger is really cool because there's a whole community of people working on things like the backends to go store these things on um, so that you can keep longer term runs of them and then poke at them and so forth. So open tracing and Jaeger give you a really broad community of tools. And since we're just literally outputting open tracing records to Jaeger, um, you have access to all of those tools from an operational point of view. In fact, the way open tracing works is, is you don't necessarily have to use Jaeger. You should be able to switch it quite easily to something that's not Jaeger if that makes a preference. There are more than one kind of tool out there. <laughs> Excuse me, sorry, cold. Yeah, no, there, there, are, there are a bunch of different tools available. Jaeger just happens to be one that's super popular. Um, but and, and it ends up being fairly easy to um, instrument things that way. So um, yeah. So uh, Jeff, I, I would think of this, it, it's kind of useful from an operational perspective, but you can see that what you're getting is traces of the internal bits and pieces for the most part. Um, maybe not ops teams, but the engineering team that backs them up could probably make, sure, make use of that. I think the ops teams would, um, uh, you, you would probably enable this when you need to diagnose an issue that, that have, has defeated your ops team rather than necessarily uh, hand this over to the ops team. No, I agree a hundred percent. And it was more of a nebulous question. I mean, this is a great tool for the stuff that I want to look at. I'm just curious if like the long-term vision is going to be like a bring your own type of thing, you know, uh, well, well, so, so open, tracing's, open tracing's definition is uh, these API calls when you want to trace something. So um, theoretically that means that again, you can bring your own if you want to bring your own or you can simply use Jaeger because obviously as, as Ed was saying, there's, there's an output phase of this where you're basically taking the trace and storing it and then an input phase where you're taking the store and turning it into something a human can read. Um, so you can do this multiple ways around. It depends how much time you want to spend doing that sort of thing or whether the default will do for you. Yeah. I mean, right, that's what I'm asking is like if we're looking at a more robust default, like I totally get like the underlying technology and what we're trying to accomplish here. I'm just like as far as when I try to sell this internally, you know, like is this kind of like a some assembly required type of mentality or is a long-term vision to, you know, have stuff a little bit more ready out of the box for NSM? Um, for, this, for this one, if you were going to consume it in production, I'd be inclined to think you would turn it on when you needed it on for specific requests. And I've seen that done in OpenStack, for instance, where, where enabling logs is on a per API basis rather than, um, sorry, enabling traces is on a per API basis rather than across the board. So yeah, there, there are perhaps patterns we could steal. The other, the other thing we kind of want to think of is, is how expensive is the tracing? Um, because, you know, and this is something again that operators are gonna to have to decide for themselves, but my general attitude is if the, if the tracing is cheap enough, just leave it the hell on. Yeah, my, uh, my preference when it comes to the tooling is to ship with something that we consider to be usable for the general community. And of course you can always replace it with something that, that meets your needs if it doesn't. So, uh, so my hope is that we end up, is that we end up with, you start, net, you start network service mesh and it also includes everything else that you need in order to, in, in order to be operational, which includes some form of a, of a system to, to log it and, and uh, to perform this tracing rather and to be able to analyze the, the traces. But to, do you have the ability to say, no, I don't want your tracing thing. I'll, I'll, bring my, I'll bring my own because we have something that, we, that we've bought or built in-house. Uh, by the way, Jaeger- yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I was asking. 
Yeah, Thanks, Frederick. Way, I just checked Jaeger supports Elasticsearch already and Cassandra as storage backends. Um, if you want to go and just say, okay, I'm going to dump all the traces into the place where I can then access them in all kinds of interesting ways. Just so you know, from a, an end user perspective, mm -hmm. being able to have this by default activated, uh, maybe not always on, but being able to do it is a, a given. And uh, from our viewpoint, is we're really if it, we really need to push so that every application is able to leverage that open open tracing and supports it, which is not the case yet. So if we push it forward, that might be an incentive for application and uh, and workload to be more open tracing compliant. I do have actually one question for the folks in the room who are actually our operators looking at deploying network service mesh. One of the things I've been sort of toying with in my head is right now we're wrapping the, the spans in the trace around gRPC calls. So each of these things, you know, the, the, each of these little lines represents the span of a gRPC call. Um, with the stuff that, that um, with the stuff that Nikolai did for putting together the composite stuff, we could, in principle, give you a span across the composite. So when you would drill down into something, you could see, okay, here is where it connected to the VP, you know, here is where it connected to the VPP, here is where it applied you know, an ACL, here is where it did the cross connect, and so you could see those pieces as sort of span child, child spans as well. Do you think that might be useful, sort of seeing some internal spans as well? Yeah. Yes. When we when we have like a, a application failures. And we've seen this with, like, for example, uh, home gateways and things like this. Being able to have access to all that data is what they, is actually able to do a problem resolution faster. Cool. And then I, I presume you would also want sort of aggregate metrics on some of these things. Like, right now we've got you know the NSMD making a call, and we can see here the the time it took 158.96 milliseconds in this case, and then I presume you'd also like to have like it tells you okay. Here's the, the statistics on the latency for those calls over time. Oh yeah, all that data ends up at some point in a data lake. So we're able to cross, cross reference. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Shall we share the agenda again? Yep, let's go ahead and uh, move on. So um, I'll jump straight into the next topic. So we have a repository move that has been successful. So uh, it was a relatively uneventful event. We performed the move. Uh, some of the tools just worked like Circle CI. Uh, the, the only major change that we had to do was, um, is that Golang uh, expects the Git repo URL to match uh, when, you, when you do an import. So we had to do a bunch of renaming of stuff. And beyond that, uh, we haven't ran into any other issues since then. So if you run into any problems due to the repo move, definitely let us know so we can get them fixed. We ha also have uh, moved over from GoDep to Go modules. So this has a couple functional changes where if you have a Git repo checked out, that uh, that you'll have to. Oh, I don't know, I'll add some documentation on this uh, in the in the repository. But uh, there's there's a couple steps that you and that you now have to take potentially. So first, uh, the Go path is while it's still there, the source code does not generally live in your Go path anymore. You just check it out, or you would normally check it out uh, if it were any other language. And when you do Go build. Uh, it'll see the existence of a Go mod file and will then go and download the versions listed within that Go mod. So that is a manifest and we'll just compile and, and build at that, at that point. So uh, this should make it a lot easier to onboard people where we don't have to explain, create your Go path this way, go download it in a specific way or so on. It's, and everything should just, uh, should just work and build from, from that point on. Uh, we've already tooled the, uh, the build as well, so the, the continuous integration system is now building on top of Go modules, so the entire repo is now on Go modules. If you want to leave it in your Go, in your Go, um, in your Go path, then for that specific repo, you'll want to turn on a, a flag. There's a Go 111 module environment variable that you can set to on, uh, not yes, but on ON. 
And when you set that on, then uh, it'll tell Go modules to to turn on, and then it'll it'll work. So uh, again, I'll add all, I'll add all of this into a uh, into a document. Uh, I just wanted to let let people know the implications uh, in in this scenario. But uh, this should make the overall build process much more simple. And we also were able to remove our vendor directory, which uh, nicks about a million lines of code off of the repo. So. Uh, so other than so other than that, uh, yeah. If anyone has any questions on on this, definitely definitely let us know. So ping ping us in the uh, ping us in the chat room if you have any problems, and we'll we'll help you through it. And one last thing, um, make sure you update your version of Go to the to the latest version if you are if you are compiling it from your from your system. The latest version is one point eleven point four. There are differences between 1.11.2 to 4, and those those differences may break your your build on any Go module. So make sure you make sure you update. Uh, beyond that, uh, that's pretty much the the entire announcements. Are there any questions? Cool. Barring any questions, uh, off to Ed for the GKE pro uh, progress. Yeah. So I spent some of this weekend beating on trying to get network service mesh working in GKE. Um, and, and so far, the, the one interesting thing I've encountered there, and we've already merged the fix for it, <clears throat> is normally when we're doing kernel interfaces in um, network service mesh thus far, we've been using a facility called TAPV2, which uses dev v host net. Um, it turns out in GKE, that unless you deviate from the default behavior and run your GKE cluster on Ubuntu, uh, dev v hostnet is not available on the basic images that they run GKE with. Um, so we've merged a patch now that will, if that device file is not available, it will fall back to v Paris plus AF packet. Now, this is slower, um, but there's a strong desire to make sure that things always work. And then you, you can work on the things that you would have to do to make them work faster. Um, so this, this moves us towards the always work behavior. Do folks have any questions so far? I'm still sort of plowing through the, the shifts. We've got a, quite a few assumptions that we've got to work out on the process. Hey, uh, this is John, just a quick, quick side question. Do you have to muck with ETH tool and TX off to get AF packet to work? Muck with what, I'm sorry? Obviously not. <laughs> it's like, if it's not ringing any bells, no. We we just had some issues with um, Google and AF Packet, so I'm trying to track it down. I just wonder if anybody else had experience with it. Yeah. So thus far, I've not been seeing issues with AF Packet thus far. Okay. Um, Google um, doesn't mean I won't. You may just be further along than I am. Um, but yeah. So far, I'm not, I'm not hitting anything. Okay. Yeah, we had UDP checks on errors, so. Oh, oh, you're hitting checks on errors with AF packet? Those yeah. I can't, I can't tell you probably what those are. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll get you yeah. on, uh, offline. Those I pretty um, sure. Th that, that, uh, that's an old favorite with DHCP, if you've seen that. I mean, it used to be the DHCP daemon would manually check the um, UDP checksum, which didn't fly very well when it wasn't being corrected because kernel interfaces generally don't correct it. Um, I don't know whether that's your circumstance or whether it's something else. Yeah, so I mean, here, here's the, 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 the really quick uh, how if you borrow version, John, which is if you have a VETH pair, um, yep. the kernel, in its infinite wisdom, and this is actually smart in, from the kernel's point of view, decides that there's no damn reason to get the checks done right across a VETH pair because it's on both ends and it's work. Um, and so if you stick AF packet on one or the other ends of a, of a VETH pair, if you are not smart enough to also ignore the fact that the kernel is just not going to do the checksum right, um, you will have issues. Yeah, I'm trying to figure it out. Okay, I'll, I'll get you, I'll that, get you that, in the chat. That's true for a VETH pair as well, Ed. So, I mean, I'm not sure that would necessarily come up as a distinction, but... Well, I mean, with a VETH pair, if you're just using kernel interfaces, you would never see it that way. I mean, you only see it when you use something like AF packet or, or TCP dump. Um, yeah, if you don't read and write raw packets, which you can do with a VETH pair, but yes, I mean, fine. I mean, it's, it's one of those things that was super, super clever on the part of the kernel guys and has caused pain for 
those of us who are in the less than the average case. Cool. Anything else on GKE stuff before we move on? Cool, Nikolai, do you wanna take the share again on the roadmap stuff or would you like me to drive? Um, no, I don't want to, to, I mean, yeah, you can just open the page and um, I don't know if we have any big updates here. Uh, I don't feel like we do, but um, yeah, maybe we can just reiterate quickly about what is it here and <clears throat> yeah, so I mean, this this was just trying as a community, and, and I would appreciate folks in the community sort of adding to the list to capture first a brainstorm of the things we think we want to do in 2019, right? Um, and then um, to try and work out sort of a basic roadmap. And I think, for example, doing a, a release for KubeCon EU um, is a super good idea. And then there were various discussions about what cadence we want to do after that, and sort of the things that folks were wanting to work on for inclusion there. Um, and I know that, that we've got various people who are interested in different things. So for example, I know we have folks here interested in SRV6, um, which you know means that if we can find someone to work on SRV6, I would love to have that in this release. But if you would go ahead and add that to the, the you know, add the things that you think need to be there for table stakes for KubeCon EU, uh, then we can sort of have a sensible discussion around them and figure out who is interested in actually working on them. And a lot of these are very cool, like, you know, the auto reconnect stuff for auto healing, um, you know, the telemetry and IAM stuff is super cool because that would allow us hopefully to do some, to, to carry the debugging that you just saw in open tracing all the way down to L3. <clears throat> so you could actually give users the ability to say, okay, um, gee, I, I'm getting really slow connectivity on this gRPC call, what's going on? Oh yeah on the third hop through the network, a lot of packets are being dropped. That's bad. Um, that kind of stuff. Uh, how about putting um, SRV6 under telco features for 0 0.9 as a hope for goal? Um, if folks are willing to wait that long, I know that we have some people on the call who are um, very anxious to <laughs> uh, earlier. Um, and I, I, yeah. I'm, I yes. do a plus one on this one. <laughs> I'm, I'm personally a huge fan of SRV6, so like it makes me happy, and I would like to get it in sooner rather than later. Um, it's just a matter of getting various people to work on things. Right. This is where I keep wanting to talk architecture, though, because I think we're comparing two things that don't relate to each other, SRIOV and SRV6 are not the same thing by any stretch of the imagination. And SRV6 shouldn't be something we have to build into NSM. It's something we should build into a service that NSM can run. So I'm, I'm a little confused how we managed to, I, I think we have a, a problem with separating the layers out here. Okay. And I think it's a problem we need to talk about because it's not gonna get better without talking about it. Okay, I think we do have an item further down the agenda for architecture discussion. Yeah, it was on last week's and we didn't make it last week though, so we'll see whether we do this week. Okay. Anything else on the roadmap, Nikolai, or other than... Well, just, uh, just a call for participation. I mean, any ideas, notes, uh, whatever, these are just examples. I mean, it's not set in stone that we need to do this release and it should be uh, 0 0.1, should be for KubeCon. It might be a good idea, but it's it's up to us to decide so yeah, the more input we get the better one of the things i would really throw out there is we've got some folks in the call who are actually from operators who are looking to deploy this stuff right and i presume that looking to deploy this stuff you're looking to be working so you can show it to people um if you could capture some of that even if it's just sort of pulling a use case out and figuring out what features need to be present to meet that use case that would also be super helpful because it gives us something to run towards yeah and it's really like a hugely fleshed out use case but Things like the, <clears throat> we'd like to be able to use SRV6 as a remote mechanism um, is certainly like, that, that's a very clear kind of need um, that people may have. So, cool. Um, so the next step of the agenda was how to improve onboarding of new community members. So we have a, a bunch of you who are new to the community, uh, many of whom I know have commented on a desire to actually get your hands dirty. And so I wanted to get a sense of what kinds of things would actually make that easier because 
we want to make sure that we get the the right things into the hands of new community members so they can start contributing. Yeah. So so basically, I just got on board a couple of weeks ago. So so for the past week, I was doing all those um, deploying stuff, and uh, only one thing. And I talk about uh, and I talked this about to uh, Nikolai just a little bit earlier today while most of you guys were sleeping. So I noticed that in the quick start. Um, the instructions. Um, I found some minor change, minor changes, or that may cause issues or difficulties for the uh, new community members to get their hands on. Um, so I don't know whether, because I still need to verify whether you got is, is a general problem or just just me that have uh, that have the problem is uh, probably if that's the case. Um, I don't know whether it is necessary for us to make the changes so that we can always deliver the uh, most up to date and the right instruction for deploy the uh, environment for an yeah, I, I would say that's actually super important because you know you want people to be able to come in and be successful out of the game. So getting the quick start right and and you know and the thing is even if you happen to have stumbled into a particular corner that most people that stumble into, um, mm -hmm. we still want to document that because you're not going to be the only one who stumbles into that corner, right? So if you know, eight out of 10 people don't hit the problem you're hitting, we still want to get it documented in the quick start. So when the two out of 10 do, uh, that they don't get stuck. Cool. So so basically, so Nikolai uh, just uh, encouraged me to do, like say, to open an issue or pull request for that. So I don't know, um, any, any suggestions for me to do those kind of updates or patch or something? So documentation pull requests are always super welcome. Um, okay. Also feel free to open an issue to track it if you'd like. Um, but it's, it's sort of the, you know, the, 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 there, there's a unique value that you have as a new community member that you will never have again. And that is you have no idea what's going on. <laughs> um, and that's an incredibly important resource that I literally can't reproduce, neither can Nikolai, neither, neither can uh, Frederick. And so capturing the kinds of things that you find confusing and turning those into documentation pull requests is unbelievably helpful. I will. Stay hungry, stay foolish, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Stay documented. <laughs> Important to stay okay. Cool. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. So we, we have ways to to become a beginner again, but none of them are pleasant. So <laughs> true. True. Um, cool. other... uh, hmm? um, sorry. Were you uh, go on? What you were going to say? Yeah, I was going to say other things that folks are looking for is newcomers. That would make it easier to get up and going and contributing. Yeah, like once once you're comfortable with uh, the repo, bring a friend so we can continue that uh, that resource. <laughs> um, I, sorry, go on. Uh, I just think that that if we have a clear roadmap with kind of some some milestones, I don't know if this is exactly the type of thing that the the first thing that that the newcomer will look for, but. If we have a kind of you know roadmap with some you know issues and say okay we want these and these things implemented, even if possible broken down to smaller things that people can just grab out of the door. Like you come to the project, read the quick quick mm -hmm. start and start doing things. Okay, this is probably uh, we utopia, but yeah, maybe we can get there sometime, at some point. Yeah, in fact. Um... If something that may end up being useful down the line is eventually somebody taking uh, taking up the mantle of uh, of helping people who are new, which could be own the documentation, own the quick start prog process, make sure it works, uh, and try to work out these type of things that could be easier for for people to to join in and to actually own that as a as a thing that uh, that that person does. So, uh, like right now, I don't think that any of us have the resources to take it on at this particular point. But as the community grows, uh, that's definitely something that we want somebody somebody taking on. One, one it, it, turn, it turns out, sorry, go on. No, I was just saying, so I know we've got a lot of newcomers here. We've heard from one of them. So could we hear, hear from more folks who are trying to get their hands dirty in the code? Yeah, we, we, don't, uh, we don't judge, so. Feel free to speak up.
So as a, not a newcomer, but a less of a, a fully a full time on this one, I think the trick is how can people contribute in the community if they're not able to be a full time developer on this. So we want to contribute or some newcomers might want to contribute, but due to other, for example, us end to end uh, workloads, we might not be able to, the, to, to, to be a full time associated to NSM, but we still want to be able to make it progress and because we want it happening. So how can we make that happen? How can we be uh, part time contributors or uh, selective contribution, do selective contributions? Okay. Now, are you thinking about contributions in code or in the more general sense? Both. I think uh, uh, if we're both to my my mindset is if we we have use cases and can we work on a part time like go into the use case and 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 even add code, that would be a good thing. At some time this might be more architecture or use case, and sometimes it might be just full time code. But I think that's the part. How can we be selective and not be uh, taking on all the pieces just to be able to deliver one piece of the uh, one piece of the puzzle? I, I think that, that point about uh, use cases is a significant one because it feels to me that um, we're at the moment kind of choosing the use cases that the code is able to implement rather than necessarily writing down the use cases without really thinking too hard. Um, so yeah, I mean, use case documentation would be fantastic. Cool. Well, I mean, do, do you, so I mean, that would be absolutely awesome and we have, you know, places we can accumulate that. You can certainly um, either accumulate, you know, you know, send patches to the doc directory in the repo, um, or if we want to start a you know, use cases page on the website, that's also basically done in Markdown, and it's a Git repo you can send patches to. Um, and then, you know, even if all you're really feeling up to is going into Google Docs and putting together a set of slides for your use case, we can link to that if you make it public. So that there's there's a lot that can be done there to help sort of, of drill out the use cases. I think um, particularly, um, and this is a personal opinion, but you know, if the use cases are basically the thing that derives the requirements of the thing, then, then having use cases in the repo so that you can say um, either this code implements this, you know, is usable against this use case, or alternatively there's a bug against it, that's kind of useful. Um, but it's a personal opinion. It, it, the problem with use cases that are not tracked is that um, you will write code that, that that's true of the use case document at a certain point in time, but not the use case document as it currently exists. So you have to be a little bit careful about that. Yeah, no, so I'm, I'm all in favor of putting things in the repo or even writing issues in GitHub for, for use cases. Um, I was just thinking in terms of, I would rather have a deck thrown together in Google um, because it's what the person writing the use case can face doing right now than have nothing, right? Yeah, so, no, absolutely. Uh, to be fair, Google's a fantastic place to actually get this prototyped because um, it means that we can all have a go at it, which means that you know you can ask opinions and get feedback, and you don't have to take notes of what people are saying. You can just let them fix it. Yeah. So um, let me sort of put you slightly on the spot here, uh, Daniel. Um, so if you could capture just a few bars, um, box or somewhere, um, I know you have ambitions towards an SRV6 use case. Um, you know, you know, some simple version thereof. That would be super helpful um, to figure out, sort of like, okay, well, what what needs to happen for that, and when would we like to be able to do that? Perfect. And I, as a comment, I would say that the code, the SDK point that Nikolai added and demoed, although maybe not complete, I think it does help for part-time contribution if you want to do and dig into a specific use case versus to have to understand the full breadth of all the NSM code. So another thing that is going to be very helpful in the near future is that as we have the roadmap uh, and we start to produce actual architectural design documents on them to help people join in and start helping, any type of review or comments on those, um, for, especially for use cases you care about, uh, if, they, if they affect your use case, will be immensely helpful. Because uh, like we're the three of us are trying our best to to keep it as uh, flexible as possible, but having more context from other people and how they actually want to use it uh, helps uh, helps tremendously. And uh, there's also experts in various technologies that uh, uh, that are on this call that are, that uh, they can help us with uh, with getting the semantics right, uh, getting the details right. So. So even if you're not able to contribute full time on this, like even even being able to spend an hour or two hours of time to review those documents and comment on them would be immensely helpful. Good to know. 
Yep, cool. Um, so <clears throat> one other thing that I, I've heard a couple of people complain about um, on a number of occasions that I'm also hoping will be easier soon is right now we've got vagrant things that people can stand up to go and do development and test things. And that's great, but I have heard people complaining that running a couple of Kubernetes VMs to go and run uh, all of this on can sort of exercise the fans a little bit on the laptop. Um, so hopefully as part of the GKE work, um, we'll have an option to go and offload all of this to the cloud um, up to and including the image builds, um, which hopefully also will make it much easier because then have GKE, you know, have, have GCP account will travel. And of course we're open to doing that for AWS and Azure as well. Um, if folks are interested in doing work on that. I was also talking to Dave Taylor and people yesterday on precisely this subject. And rather than reinvent the wheel, I wonder whether we can kind of use some of the CI stuff so that if we change our own deployment system, then we, we improve the CI at the same time. Because obviously it has to do exactly the same job. Yep. Yeah, that's so, how the... Um, that's how the mechanisms work. And I actually debugged a bunch of packet stuff back when we were first getting packet online by uh, effectively just running make commands and uh, targeting the packet systems rather than targeting my local vagrant systems. So that's totally possible. The one thing we'll have to do is we'll have to be careful to make sure that continues to work because it, it is easy to, to break that, uh, that semantic. Yeah, but but well, again, what, what I was talking about with with uh, the other guys was um, that we're maybe lumping things together where at least one of these things we should be consuming from outside. We don't need to know how to bring virtual machines up. We need something that will do that for us. And then from there, we can take it on. Um, and technically speaking, we don't need to know how to install Kubernetes either. That's not necessarily something that should live in our repo. We should start with the bit that's NSM specific. Um, and and be using a library from the other half if we can find one or build one. Yeah, the the, the two are the two are separate. Uh, like we we tie them together at the top with them with the make file, but they they are separate. Uh, they are they're separate. separate, but they're separate in our repository. Is my point rather than being you you know again we're not the only people who we need Kubernetes clusters spinning up. There's, that code exists elsewhere. Yeah, yeah, that that is true. And we have we have a fair bit of modularity around all of this in the make files right now. Uh, they were sort of designed so that, you know, people could pick their poison. Um, so I do apologize. I've got a, a hard stop at the end of the hour. I have to drop off. Folks should feel free to remain as long as they'd like to. Um, and do remember to sign off at the end because that's what triggers the flushing of all of this to YouTube. That way we don't get 30 minutes of oddly silent time at the end of the video. Cool. So I have a little bit of extra time left. Uh, I think we should drop the main agenda. Um, and if anyone has any comments or questions that are more free form for the rest of the hour, we can definitely do that. Uh, and saying that, thank you everyone for attending the Midwork Service Mesh meetings. Uh, meeting time will be same time next week. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll make sure to put some of the architecture stuff at the beginning of the meeting so we can talk about them. So and with that, that's, uh, thank you everyone for, for attending. Uh, I'll Thanks everyone. Thank you guys. Thanks. Bye, guys. Ooh, look like there's no questions, so I'm going to hop off as well then. Uh